Aloha, welcome to the debrief from Hawaii News Now. I'm your host, Emily Cristobal. And in today's episode, we are tackling one of the biggest crises Hawaii is facing, a shortage of affordable housing. According to recent data from the U.S. Census, over 15,000 people left the islands between 2020 and 2022. That's about 20 people leaving every day. The high cost of living from groceries to housing is causing droves of locals and native Hawaiians to leave the place they call home. Data also shows that there are officially more native Hawaiians living in the continental U.S. than in Hawaii, which was especially seen with the Council of Native Hawaiian Affairs holding their conference in Las Vegas for the first time ever this year. But with all that being said, Hawaii is working on solutions to combat this issue of the dire need for housing. And to discuss that and more, we are joined by State Senator Stanley Chang and State Representative Troy Hashimoto. They are some of the key lawmakers who spearheaded housing measures that the governor recently signed into law. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yes, so you know, I wanted to dive right into it. Governor Josh Green signed several bills expanding access to affordable housing and providing much needed assistance to families and individuals at risk of becoming homeless. Senator Chang, I was hoping you could go first and describe some of the bills that were passed along through the Senate side and what are now law. One of the bills that I'm most excited about, Emily, is Senate Bill 865. It was recently signed by the governor, as you mentioned. This is the Aloha Homes concept that I've been working on since 2018. And basically the concept is modeled on the Singaporean 99-year leasehold model. What we're doing is we're uh, going to have the Hawaii Community Development Authority, a state agency, identify a parcel of land in Kaka'ako on which they will build a tower. Um, They will sell the condos for 99-year leasehold terms to Hawaii residents who are owner-occupants who own no other real property. And the goal is for this to be as revenue neutral as possible and also to be as income blind as possible um, so that there will not need to be a heavy taxpayer subsidy and that if demand is strong, if people like this concept, that the agency can then go on and build additional towers in the future. Yes, thank you so much for explaining that. And, you know, before we get into that 99-year leasehold program, I definitely want to delve into that. But first, I want to talk to uh, Representative Hashimoto. If you could describe some of the bills passed forward from the House side. Yeah, you know, I think there's so many great bills that were passed this legislative session. I think one of them was a loan program out of the Dwelling Unit Revolving Fund um, to allow um, regular residents to, to... uh, get a loan, a low cost interest loan um, for, to bring down the cost of their for sale housing unit that they're purchasing. I think we focused specifically on those who are in high need areas, so teachers, farm workers, nurses, um, because we wanted to make sure that we want to keep people here in Hawaii. And so those who are getting assistance from the state, we want to make sure that th- those people will, will help us meet some of our goals. And so that, that was a very important bill to really you know, jumpstart some of the um, affordability issues that we're facing uh, for people to really afford a home. And I think the thing about that bill is that you know, it's, there's shared appreciation. So if the, uh, the appreciation of that house goes up, the state, if they decide to sell it, the state will take part in the appreciation of that home. Um, and of course, it's a very low interest loan. So I think that's a very exciting program that we are piloting. So we're going to see if that will move the needle a little bit. And if it's proven successful, hopefully we can expand that program even more. Yes, and you mentioned that it's a pilot program. When exactly does that start? So as soon as they can get the rules up and running, because there's some administrative hurdles that they will have to kind of figure out and all the details of how it will work. So I'm hoping within the next year we can roll that program out. Um, And so there's funding attached to it already. And so we will want to see who will qualify and how we'll track those folks to see how long they'll keep the unit. And if they decide to sell, um, what does that appreciation look like? Um, And if there's a lot of interest, I think we we, we know that there's going to be a lot of interest uh, because I think when you take a look at the mortgage rates these days, it's pretty high. So th- I think when our, we envision that this will allow you to have a lower interest rate. And, you know, lower interest loans. What is that lower interest? Like, do you have a number that that would be? So that's something that they're going to have to figure out in the rulemaking process. I think historically it has been lower than market. Um, and so I think they will have to determine these days market rates are much higher than they were just, you know, two years ago. 
Um, so I think what we want to make it worth it, but again, it's state dollars. So we want to make sure that the, the, the money revolves and we can help the, the next group of um, folks that are looking for housing. So we can't make it too cheap uh, because I think we do need to generate a little bit of money to help um, those, those folks that do not, aren't in this first tranche of getting funding. Yeah, and one thing that I really um, am very receptive on with that uh, measure is that you're focusing on, you know, farmers, teachers, nurses, these people in society that we really rely on to, you know, build our community and keep it running. So that's very important. Senator Chang, I wanted to go back to that 99-year leasehold program that you talked about. Just verbatim, this was from the governor's uh, press release of when that bill was signed. It says, quote, this bill establishes a 99-year leasehold program to develop low-cost homes on state and county-owned land in an urban redevelopment site. And I was hoping you could kind of explain a little bit more into detail what exactly that means. So there are a lot of provisions and it's kind of technical and complex, but essentially what we want to do is we want to focus on state-owned lands that are near transportation. And so we all know that the skyline is now in operation. We don't think that we should be adding thousands of new cars to the roads with our future development. So we want to look at parcels that the state already owns, so there's no additional cost to taxpayers that are along those transit corridors so that people can walk within their in individual neighborhoods to access whatever services like the bank, the post office, the grocery store, um, and then they can have a short walk to the skyline to access the rest of um, job opportunities, educational opportunities, and what have you. So I think that future development should be concentrated along this rail line instead of sprawling into the suburban and undeveloped areas. You know, you said focus on state-owned land. Um, what are some of the state-owned land? Like, where are these areas? Can you kind of describe where in the community these places are? So the first pilot project will be in the Kaka'ako area, but um, actually the state is the largest landowner on the rail line. Um, the terminal at East Kapole is surrounded by hundreds of acres of state-owned land. Um, many of the stations, Hawaii commu uh, Honolulu Community College, Leeward Community College, um, are near or on the stations themselves. So. Um, I think that those are all really ripe redevelopment opportunities. And I think we can all agree that affordable housing is going to be the highest and best use for this large portfolio of state lands that are on the rail stations. I would like to add that we actually did also give $35 million um, to the Hawaii Community Development Agency, who's going to work with um, the University of Hawaii and the Hawaii Housing Finance Development Corporation to do a 20-acre uh, parcel right next to the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. Um, and so that was within the state budget. Um, all they needed was on-site infrastructure, and they were going to then try and find a development partner um, to move that project forward. So I think there is a lot of different projects in the pipeline. I think that's also on state-owned property. I think the only difference between that particular property at West Oahu is that the university has a mission to make a little bit of money off of it to, to help fund their endeavors in West Oahu. Um, we don't envision that to be a problem, but I think it's, it's a great opportunity, especially because it's right next to the rail line um, that will, and it, it should be a, a quick time frame of them being able to get this off the ground, but we're, we're going to test it. Um, I think that too is a pilot that we'll see if we can, how fast we can develop the 20 acres. You know, it's really interesting that will be next to UH West Oahu. It can really serve that community out there, you know, instead of having to travel all the way to, you know, UH Manoa to go to school. Um, you'll have residential houses right next to that college and residential areas, you know, so definitely providing that need for that side of the, the island. Um, you know, even talking about like 99 year leasehold, does the 99 years mean that you have to stay there for 99 years or until you pass on? Like how exactly does that work? So leasehold is um, kind of a new concept for a lot of people, um, but I'll try to explain it as simply as I can. So a leasehold for the duration of the 99 year term is pretty much the same as a fee simple property. The only difference is that you get kicked out after 99 years. So until that 99 year period is up, you can sell it, you can mortgage it, you can pass it to your heirs, you can live in it. Um, and so the reason why 99 years is significant is because 
um, a lot of the existing state leasehold terms are only 65 years. And it's easy to see that a young person, maybe straight out of college, maybe 20, in their early 20s, would be able to outlive a 65-year lease. They would be in their late 80s or early 90s. And, you know, people are living that long these days. So a 99-year lease, however, will take everyone to the end of their natural lives. So they would have the security of knowing that they would never have to move before they die. Now, on the other hand, they would be free to sell and they would be free to move if um, they wanted to, but they wouldn't have to. And I think that's the security that ownership brings as opposed to, say, renting. Like you mentioned, it is kind of a new concept, you know, that's kind of coming up. Um, I feel like it's a very uh, common notion for people being very encouraged and expected to one day, you know, own a home, own a property. What would you kind of say to that sentiment of, you know, switching that mindset between leasehold versus fee simple? So fee simple is really well known here in Hawaii. The American dream in our country is to own that home, that white picket fence. And... There's nothing wrong with that, and I'm all for it. The issue, though, is that we have um, state lands. State lands are Im basically impossible to alienate the fee interest of. Um, if the state wanted to sell lands in fee simple, it would require an act of the legislature, which is not going to be realistic for hundreds or thousands of condos at a time. But more importantly, by separating the fee interest from the leasehold interest, you're bringing down the cost. Um, to pay for a home in fee simple, you're buying that, um, that fee interest in the land as well. And if you're only buying a lease, then you're gonna be paying less. So it's a way to make housing less expensive and more accessible for most Hawaii families. Talking about that lower price, um, is there, I mean, we've already seen like housing prices and you know even rent soar, skyrocket in some ways. Is there going to be like a standard rate or even a potential cap on these prices? Or how exactly do you see this working into the future for these people to continue to live there for years and years to come? So when these units are sold to their first buyers, when they're brand new, my vision would be that they are sold just for the cost of construction. So there would be no person in the role of the developer trying to make a profit by selling. They would build the units, and then recover the costs through the sales prices. But because the state is not a for-profit corporation, it doesn't make a profit on them. And I think, you know, based on some of the preliminary figures that I've seen, that that could be, you know, 15, 20% cheaper than the market rate units um, at the very least that we're seeing. The next question is what happens for the secondary market, the resale market? So, Emily, if you were to buy one of these units and after 10 years, you know, let's say you have a family that's growing and you want more space and you wanted to sell that unit, well, are you going to be able to sell it for the market price and, rec and capture that entire you know, um, gain, that appreciation and home value that Representative Hashimoto was talking about earlier? Or should the state play a role by having an equity share where the state would recapture a certain percentage? I think a great argument can be made that the state should be recapturing a percentage if it was sold to you for 20% below market price, the state should be able to collect 20% of the um, proceeds as well if and when you sell that unit. But um, you know that question is up to the agency right now, to their rulemaking process, and so we'll see how that goes. I really appreciate you diving into that. That was uh, definitely, you know, when I was reading that, I really appreciated just understanding how exactly that will work and kind of, you know, like you said, it's still like in the works and we're still seeing how it can like play out in the future and, you know, seeing the different situations if like someone else wanted to, you know, sell that property eventually to move into a place that better suits their growing family. Um, and I just wanted you both before I move on to my next topic to just hone in to how these measures will benefit Hawaii residents and maybe provide examples of how they can maybe see this play out for them? Yeah, I, I think you, we're, we're both looking at it in a longer term view, I think, in some of the programs that we are trying to roll out right now. And I think it's it's in its infancy stage, right? I think a lot of it is in the pilot stage. Although we've been at it for, for many, many years, I think it's a perfect storm um, this year because I think we have a governor who's very interested in housing. I think the legislature has become very, very interested in housing. Um, and so I think moving these bills is a testament to that. But I think now the, the question, especially some of these more 
groundbreaking bills, it's, it's the implementation, right? And so part of it is taking the time to make sure something like the 99 year leases will be rolled out in a very methodical and thoughtful manner. I think the agencies will be um, very instrumental in making sure that we think through what will happen if we implement these bills in the long term. Because I think we, we may be okay, maybe in the, the, the first, you know, 60, 70 years, but when you're in that last 30 years of a, a lease, what, what happens, right? When you can't necessarily finance that last 30 years, are you gonna automatically renew that 99 year leasehold? So, and also the question is, is, is there gonna be escalations in the leaseholds um, in terms of price? Um, are, are we sure that we're not going to sell this land at, at a certain point, right? And I, so I think we need to make sure that that's all set and we, we've given money to make sure that this is all studied. Um, and so I think that is um, the first steps in all of it. But I think the long term goal is longer term affordability and widespread affordability for a lot of people. And so that takes at the end of the day, it, it, it's a supply and demand issue. So we just need to make sure that the supply is there. And I think what, that's what we're trying to figure out is how do we introduce more supply? So I think the other side of the issue is also we, we invested a whole lot of money into the state budget to help with the supply side issue. Um, but it also will take some policy measures that we've mentioned, these, these other two bills that we were mentioning. So it's a lot of different factors. It's not going to be solved overnight. And it's, I think everyone's going to have to be patient. Um, but I think we're going to be trying some very interesting things over the next couple of years. And we'll have to measure and we'll have to see if they will actually move the needle. And if not, we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to try some other things. Um, but I think the main thing is that we keep at it and we keep trying and we make sure that more units are being built. I completely agree with everything that Representative Hashimoto said. You know, the fundamental problem here in Hawaii is that every year we have about 13,000 high school seniors graduating. Um, so they're adults, they're ready to start their new lives. Unfortunately, every year we build about 2,000 units of housing. So. What we're saying to our graduating seniors is it's great that you may have been born and raised and educated here, but now that you're an adult, you have to leave and you can never come back because this is not your home and will never be your home again. And that's the problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to create enough supply so that we can house every future generation of local people. And the way we do that, there are many different options. I personally think that we're not gonna get to that 10,000 units a year. Um, a couple at a time, like a, you know, a unit here, a unit there, or even a couple hundred units here or there. But we're going to need to start counting in the thousands, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 units at a time. And um, you know, the only developer that has the capacity, that has the land portfolio, and that is not motivated by a strict profit motivation is the state. And so while there have been a number of reforms to make it easier for private sector uh, developers to build more housing, um, I think that the fact is that we're not going to close that entire 10,000 unit gap with just um, tinkering around with incentivizing or streamlining the private sector. I think the state is going to have to take a really large intervention into the housing sector. Um, I kind of call it like public school for housing, a, a large scale, low cost mass option that's available to anybody who wants it. And, um, you know, in the same way that public schools, public parks and public highways are available. Very interesting. A public school for housing is definitely, I mean, public housing. Can we kind of delve into that? What exactly would you define as public housing and who can qualify for that? So public housing has a really negative image um, in our community. And I think that goes back to its founding when real estate development interests said, you know, federal government, you want to build more housing because we have this housing crisis, but we don't want you competing with us. So you're going to have to do an income restriction on every unit that you build. And for every unit that you build, you have to demolish one as well. So we're, you're, we're not going to allow you to grow the supply of housing. And we're also not going to allow you to sell or to rent to the middle class, only to the very poor. And as a result of those decisions that have been reinforced over the years, um, public housing has come to you know be seen as the concentration of poverty and always needing a large taxpayer subsidy and never being maintained or repaired as well as private sector housing. And those are all results of the decisions that were made and continue to be made to have the government not compete with the private sector. And that's not my vision. Um, I think the difference between today's generation of public housing and the public housing that was envisioned in years past is that this would be 
both income blind and revenue neutral. So income blind means it doesn't matter how much money you make, just like our public schools. It doesn't matter if Oprah Winfrey or Larry Ellison or Piero Midiar wanted to send their kids to our public schools, community college, and then to the University of Hawaii system, even though they're clearly capable of paying their own way for private school, private college, private university, um, because we are all equal here in America. If the schools, if the public schools are good enough for a homeless family, they're good enough for the billionaires as well. Um, and when you make something income blind, then that no longer requires a large taxpayer subsidy. So current subsidy programs, the current government state um, programs subsidize housing at $177,000 per unit. That is just an incredible amount of money. Um, that would take, if we were to build 10,000 units a year, it would take $1.77 billion a year. And I don't think any of our listeners are in the mood to start ponying up billions and billions of dollars in new taxes every year to sustain that. We can't do that. It's just not possible, which is why we have to focus on the second aspect, which is revenue neutrality. So the state builds units, but then it is able to sell them to recover the cost of building. And as a result, taxpayers are never on the hook. And as a result of that, the units are scalable. We, we don't have to, we're not just going to be limited by the number of dollars that the legislature appropriates from year to year. And in bad years, the legislature is not going to be able to appropriate much, if anything. Instead, the state can continually build these revenue neutral units and scale up to thousands a year, tens of thousands of, year, uh, of units a year if necessary. So um, again, it's, it's something like public school for housing. It would be available for all. It wouldn't be you know, deeply subsidized, so it wouldn't be dirt cheap, but it would be significantly cheaper than the private sector housing, and it would be available to all regardless of income. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I wanted to dive into, you know, the topic of affordability, defining what affordable housing means. Um, right now, we see some new builds coming up and in those structures, they're setting aside a portion of it for, quote, affordable housing. But is it really affordable? You know, I think that's a, it's a really good question. And I think a lot of people within the community, that's the first thing that they ask is, well, what do you mean by affordable, right? And I think that is because they go out and, and they look at a unit and they, they, it's marketed as affordable. And of course they can't really pay for that on a monthly basis. And I think it's a very legitimate concern. Um, I, I think when we take a look at it from a policy perspective, you know, there is a, a ver various different categories. So the state mainly focuses on, at the current time, 60% of the area median income. So the state follows federal guidelines of what is the area median income, and then they'll set, set some standards. Um, and we are primarily funding that through our rental housing revolving fund for those projects that are 60% of the area median income. And that's really what we are investing a lot of money. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of putting it up with low income housing tax credits from the federal government, along with the rental housing revolving fund, as I said, and that's how we're making those type of projects pencil. Um, so those are fully 60% um, and below type of housing. And, you know, I think that's, you know, that, that's, it's not much that we're building, but if you're able to get it, you're very, very lucky, right? And so there's others that are m mixed uses. Um, so it'll go, f you know, have a certain amount of um, units that are required to be within that 60 to 30 range, all the way up to go to 120 percent, 140 percent, depending on, you know, what the calculation is and what you agreed with with the city um, or the state, then you'll, you'll have that affordability mix. Um, so, you know, I think it, it does, it, it may not be affordable for all, but I think, you know, what the problem right now is, is we're trying to figure out how do we build more in that missing middle, which is kind of the working class, you know, probably a teacher, probably a nurse, right? And that will go from that 60% to maybe 120% area median income. And that's what we're really not building a lot of. And that's part of the problem is because, you know, 60%, you know, and below, you're, you're gonna have to, you know, you, you, it's, it's more of a subsidy more than anything, but really, you know, we need more housing for that, that middle class. Um, and we're not really building that because the private market can't seem to build enough of it. The state isn't subsidizing it, um, you know, uh, r right of our rental housing revolving fund. Um, and so I think it's a trickle down effect because if, it, again, it's a supply issue. If we're not providing enough supply, everyone's gonna be hurt. Absolutely, and you know, I wanted to ask, 
why isn't um, funds being set aside to create more housing for this middle class? I mean, I've been listening in on like press conferences, you know, as like part of the news. And, you know, recently Governor Josh Green said that they're going to start, you know, for new teachers, they're going to bring up their wages to like $50,000. But $50,000 is still not going to get you to that affordable housing. So what do you say to, you know, people who work in those jobs so crucial for our society that can't afford to live here. Absolutely. For the, for the teachers, that's an interesting one because that was a specific bill that I worked on this year um, along with uh, many other people uh, to, to jumpstart the teacher housing um, development. So we're, we're assigning the School Facilities Authority the ability to now build housing for specifically teachers because we, we recognize that it's a high need. Um, area that we don't have enough teachers. I think their compensation sometimes isn't enough, especially in those early years, to afford staying in Hawaii. Um, and so we've we've tasked the school facilities authority to see if they can build housing on or off campus. I think in my mind, the more lucrative type of housing is off campus because if you're a teacher, you may not want to live where you work. Um, but I think the, the bottom line is that we need to focus in on this area to see if we can get something off the ground. So, you know, the governor, we, the legislature appropriated 170 million. I think the governor took, 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 a, um, took a look at that number and said, can we actually spend it in the time frame that we have, which is one year and I think he decided well possibly not so he brought that appropriation down to about 50 million so we're hoping that we can begin that process of planning uh, for for teacher housing um, and so I think there are some key areas that we are targeting into one is Mililani somewhere in the Mililani area we allocated funds for each of the neighbor islands so one on each neighbor island and one on the windward side um, also Nanakuli and Waipahu is uh, also in that mix um, so again, this is a pilot pro project. We got to see how it works. Um, we have to see if it can get off the ground. But you know, teachers are only one of the many professions um, that are out there. And I think we're going to have to really think deeply because we do have a brain drain of, of folks because of housing, as we mentioned before. Um, and so we're going to have to figure out um, more pro programs for them, um, you know, various options. Uh, because, you, you know, I don't think we can ever solve it solely on salary because when you take a look at it, obviously cost of living, when you take a look at cost of living, housing is your biggest component. So if we can take care of that housing component and bring that down, that dollar will stretch much further um, for whatever they're getting paid. And uh, Senator, I wanted to bring up, you know, you mentioned that we have like these high school seniors graduating from, you know, schools, private schools, public schools, and, you know, hope in hopes of, you know, going to college. But, you know, that message of, you know, are they able to come back home? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the next generation of Hawaii's residents. What in the process of thinking about housing, what are your plans do you see of housing the next generation? How do you see being able to keep locals living here for generations and generations to come? I think that every local person born, raised, educated here should have the ability to live here. You talked at the top of the show about the over half of Native Hawaiians who now live outside the homeland of their ancestors. I think it's it's a travesty that we've allowed the housing shortage to get so bad that we're at this point where we've now entered seven straight years of population decline, where the great majority of young people will have to leave. And it's not just Native Hawaiians. Over half of all Hawaii-born bachelor's degree holders now live outside of Hawaii as well. Um, so how are we actually going to house them? So traditionally, what Hawaii has done is to um, build large suburban subdivisions on previously undeveloped land. A lot of my district is like that. A lot of Representative Hashimoto's district is like that. Um, that's kind of what we think of, the single family home, the you know quarter acre lot, or maybe a little bit smaller, um, and people driving everywhere. Now, even if we wanted to continue that model, the reality is I've never heard anyone say, well, if we have 10,000 homes to build a year, um, then we should pave over the 2,500 acres of undeveloped land every year in order to build those homes. That's 2,500 acres a year, every single year, forever. And not just on Oahu, but on all, all of the islands. And I think we can all agree, Emily, that the natural habitats for our indigenous and endangered species 
the food production capacity of the state of Hawaii in our agricultural lands are very important. And we should not be contemplating throwing all of that away just to build thousands of acres of suburban sprawl every year. And so that's why I think the real answer is to concentrate that development in the urban core where the transportation infrastructure has already been built at dear cost to Hawaii taxpayers. And so, for example, the Aloha Stadium site, the 98-acre parcel that is currently slated for redevelopment, has the potential to house tens of thousands or even 100,000 homes, hundreds of towers, each 50 stories tall. I think that, that would be kind of a shocking image for those of us who are used to the palm trees and the secluded beaches marketing of Hawaii. But the reality is this, if we are able to build that many units on one parcel, then we can house the entire state's housing demand for 15 years. And that means that we need never touch an existing neighborhood. We need never develop on a single inch of agricultural or conservation land. We can keep Hawaii Hawaii while only affecting very small parts of the state. Um, ones that, like I said, already have the infrastructure and for which infrastructure funds are currently being invested to accommodate that kind of growth. And so, yes, I do think that the high density model is a little bit shocking. I also think that every, you know, if, if you want to build lower and lower density, then the reality is you're going to need more and more land. And the reality of that is you're going to need to pave over agricultural and conservation land. And that's just not a sacrifice that I think most people in Hawaii are willing to make. With all that being said, you kind of see our future, do you see it as more high rises versus, you know, single family homes of like, you know, that suburban sprawl that you mentioned? So I wouldn't propose to affect, you know, for the state to go in and condemn our existing single family homes and start to redevelop. That's not, I don't think that that would fly either. I think that the future growth of Hawaii should take place in this much more sustainable manner, the high density model that we see, you know, all over the world, but even right here in Honolulu, you know, we actually have the fourth most skyscrapers in the United States here in Honolulu, believe it or not. New York and Chicago are way, at number ha way ahead at one and two. LA only has 40 more than Honolulu. Honolulu has more skyscrapers than San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, Dallas, Houston, Miami, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, DC, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, all these cities that we think of as bigger than Honolulu. And that is because for generations, Hawaii has already embraced that high density model. And so I think it's, you know, uh, a continuation of a trend that's already existed here for, for many decades. You know, I also wanted to talk about, you know, developing, building in Hawaii. Why is it so difficult for developers to build in Hawaii? Well, I do want to go back real quick <clears throat> about density, because I think that's all well in on Oahu. But I think once you, and that's a very Honolulu-centric answer, right? And I think coming from the neighbor islands, I, I do want to mention that you know, I think we're, we're all for density, but I think when you go out and talk about a project on a neighbor island, I think it's a very unique lifestyle, and I think people, it, it's very difficult to build very dense on the neighbor island, and I, and I would contend that it's probably very difficult for us to build in some areas of Oahu fairly dense, and so that's part of the problem, right? It's a, it's a we know what we've, uh, we understand what it's like um, with single family homes. People love it. That's the culture of our neighborhood. And a lot of people don't want to change. I don't necessarily disagree with Senator Chang that density is very important. But I think when you get to the intersection of trying to really figure out how to develop something that's dense and you go out into the community, I think it's, it's very, very difficult. And that's, that's part of the problem with developers trying to develop, right? They want to do a large scale project and then they're forced to kind of you know, lower their amount of units, which then affects how their financing works. Um, so I think it's a, it's a matter of us really trying to think as a community, what do we really want, right? And I think we, we're going to need housing. Um, it's probably going to be a, a lot in certain areas or along the rail line is probably where the future of, you know, in the near future, where a lot of it is going to be. You know, that's why I was watching closely. Uh, Kamehameha Schools was trying to develop a tower in Waipahu, and I think the community was getting very upset on the density. And I was watching that very closely because if, if the density came down too low, then that would, that would show a signal that, you know, along the rail line, we're not willing to build dense. And I think that is where the density needs to be. 
I think on a neighbor island, you know, we can probably get up to three or four stories in certain areas, but we got to be very strategic and think, um, you know, long, long term view of where that's going to be. And I think that's that's starting to be the trend now um, of trying to plan for the future, especially along the transit oriented development routes on the neighbor islands. You know, rail is the specific one on Oahu, but there are um, uh, TOD zones of what we call on the neighbor islands as well, where the bus route goes. So I think that is um, going to be a very, very important um, thing to, to make sure that is done um, in the near future. And I think the biggest other barrier for, for a lot of this development, especially if we want density, is obviously infrastructure. Um, and I think along the areas that we want to develop, that is actually what is slowing down a lot of our development is because we don't have enough sewer capacity. We do not have enough electrical capacity. And I think now more than ever because of this Red Hill issue, and it's always been an issue on the neighbor islands, is water capacity. Right. And so even if we wanted to build a whole lot very quickly, we don't have the fundamental um, things in place to allow that to happen. And so, you know, in the past, we've asked developers, you go and, you know, if you want to do your development, you go and figure out how to put all that in and it's on your dime. And then, of course, they're not going to eat that cost. They're going to pass it on to to the people that want to live in that development. And of course, that's why things don't pencil out. That's why we don't have more housing. And so I think this, the strategy now moving forward is that the state and the counties really want to try and be strategic in trying to pick up some of that infrastructure cost. Because historically, that's really what the county and state should be doing. They should be doing infrastructure. Um, and that's how we subsidize projects versus you know, a straight subsidy to a specific project. We do the infrastructure, bring down the cost of the infrastructure, and pass along the savings. And if you do the math, it's, it's, it's far less expensive. And so lots of other issues on why it's hard to develop, but I think just some insight um, of a, a, the, the, one of the big ones. As we speak, there's actually like a bunch of people testifying about a high rise being built in Mo'ili'ili. And, you know, the housing development claims that they'll include like all this affordable housing. But, you know, if a young professional or even like a teacher can't afford to buy um, or want to live in that area, how can you expect these families to pay that price? What happens to them? Are they now displaced? Like what, what housing do they get in return? So, you know, that's always a question that comes up whenever you're developing on already developed land. So a new tower is proposed, you know, the existing residents of the site are paying a fairly low rent, maybe a below market rent. And then the tower is going to be charging, you know, in the upper six figures for new condominiums. Um, that displacement issue is, is always a tough issue. And, you know, I, I think it's it really gets to the core of what we value about our communities. Are we here to, you know, are, is, is the job of the state to come in and, and demolish existing communities and then displace those individuals, whether they be low income or high income, and replace them, you know, with a new set of towers and so on. And, and I, I, I mean, it's, it's very drastic. I, I don't think that in Hawaii that that on a large scale would be acceptable to people. Um, I, I guess that's why my theory of the case is if we confine this new development to these state-owned lands near the rail stations, like a community college, for example, the state wouldn't need to displace any existing residents. It could simply build new housing for people where there was, you know, underutilized land there before. And so, um, you know, your earlier question, Emily, was about the, the difficulty of development. I think that, you know, there are a lot of regulations, there's zoning, there's the Land Use Commission um, that have been layered on. But the reason that they've been layered on over the years is because people have reacted to development proposals that they disliked and said, you know what, we're going to require that environmental impact needs to be assessed before um, a project like this moves forward. Or we're going to need to assure that a certain percentage of the units be affordable in order for a project like this to move forward. And I just don't think that that model um, has worked. Um, the amount of housing that gets built is, is far short of demand. Um, attempts to streamline those processes, like there's a, you know, my favorite example of this is called 201H. 201H-38 is a Hawaii law that actually allows a developer to come in and basically ignore all the zoning, density, height, and other restrictions 
in, in exchange for um, building half the units to be affordable to 100%, 140% of the area median income or less, which in a recent year was $867,500. So if I were a developer and I saw a parcel of land, as long as half the units were $867,000, I could charge anything I want for the remainder, and I could bypass zoning, I could bypass all of these restrictions um, in exchange for just one up or down vote at the city council or the county council. And you know that I think that as we've seen with the Mo'ili'ili Tower and, and what you're and what you're talking about, if if that um, law continue, you know, if if that's wholesale, you know, if if we get ten thousand units a year that way, I, I think that we would face a lot of the same controversies that Boyle Heights in Los Angeles, like Brooklyn and New York, are facing when it comes to displacement and gentrification. And that's why I think we really need to be focusing on ma making use of our underutilized non-residential parcels that are in the urban core rather than, you know, putting all of our chips into uprooting and displacing existing residents. Obviously, with the coronavirus, a lot of people started working from home. And now in downtown Honolulu, for example, some office spaces might not be being utilized the same way it was, you know, in the past. Are there any plans to potentially maybe redevelop or create housing in those office spaces? Is that an idea that you guys are thinking of in the state? Yeah, you know, I think this was uh, um, something that's happening slowly. It's actually pretty difficult to do the conversion. Um, I think Senator and I have visited 1132 Bishop. I've, you know, I've been watching very, very closely the Avalon Group, who's going to um, convert the Theo Davies building downtown. Um, I've been talking with the developer, Bill 7 project of um, converting the HPU building downtown into um, residential development. So it's, it's starting, but I think they're also facing incredible hurdles. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that the Avalon group was um, really looking at was how do I get the exemption that 1132 Bishop got without having to, without having windows that open, right? And so that's a city regulation. So they had to jump through those hoops. And so I think there is room for um, improvement in streamlining those processes. I think their adaptive reuse is very, very important because I think you're right, commercial space is um, readily available um, throughout downtown right now. And I think it'd be very good for housing and it'll help the, the character of downtown because I think if you can get more people there on a regular basis, especially at night, I think that'll be a very, very good thing. Um, and so, you know, but, but the problem is, is to get to that point of actually converting those units, it's almost like building a brand new um, unit, a brand new development. And so we have to figure out how do we help them? How do we help that process, both the developer and the city? to streamline those processes without, you know, I, I think there are, is some concern that you're taking care of the surrounding area with making sure that there's park, park fees and park dedications. I think that's one of the barriers though, even though they want to make that consideration because when you developed it as a commercial space, you didn't really consider that park space. Um, you know, and I think, you know, that windows was an issue because it has to be a certain size that, uh, of the building because, you know, you can only cut up a building so much, uh, so it, each unit has a window. So I think at the city council, they were even contemplating what if we had units without windows um, and whether that's a good idea or not, I'm not sure they'll have to really figure that one out um, and if that will meet some building codes. Um, so a lot to contemplate, but I think we need to, to really focus on the revitalization of downtown. It's, and I think it's something that will continually work with the city to figure out, because I think it is, um, pretty much a, a city issue, but I think on the neighbor islands, there is a question about can we do more with our business um, and commercial areas, right? Because I think we have shopping centers that are vacant and that potentially could be right for redevelopment, but we just need to figure out how we can do that and uh, put the regulations in place that'll make it much easier. Now this is just part one on this housing discussion on The Debrief. In our next episode, we'll be delving into what lawmakers are doing to prevent outside investors from the continental U.S. and international from buying homes here in Hawaii, as well as a soaring price of rent. We'll also be addressing questions and sentiment from our viewers who submitted responses on our social media platforms. You can watch and listen to more of The Debrief at hawaiinewsnow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. This is your host, Emily Cristobal, and mahalo for listening.